Everyone, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here at St. Paul's uh, as we come together to reflect uh, with Father Brian Hare on this important issue of social justice, the parish, the nation, uh, very timely, of course, in our world for what the Catholic Church, in her thinking about these important topics, is able to bring to us at this moment. Um, I'd like to also uh, welcome those who are joining us online. We're very happy to have that capacity here uh, in our church to be able to do this. And so welcome uh, to all those who are joining us uh, via this important technology. I want to uh, lead us in uh, prayer, but I just want to say a word of thank you to the committee that has worked so hard uh, in inviting Father Hare to be back and I'll leave it to uh, Angela after our prayer to make the formal introductions. So if we could pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, here in this holy place, we're reminded of the great teachings of St. Paul, that it is in loving you first that we are called to love one another. We ask that as we come together for this afternoon's talk and lecture, that our hearts will be moved, our minds will be deepened in its understanding of how your revelation teaches us how to live and to love one another. We ask your blessings on Father Hare uh, for his many years of service here at St. Paul's and at Harvard and for being here with us today. We entrust into your care all those who are most in need, and we ask you to hold our loved ones and all of our parishioners living and deceased in your loving care. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite Angela now to uh, lead us uh, and make our formal introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Father Kelly. Good afternoon. As Father said, my name is Angela Jones. Last year, our nation started wrestling with issues of social justice in a more deeply intensified way in light of the George Floyd killing. Fellow Parish Council member Mercedes Evans and I initiated a discussion on the Parish Council regarding social justice. After all, social ju justice is not a left issue or a right issue or an independent or neutral issue for that matter. Social justice is a gospel issue, indeed a gospel teaching. The lecture this afternoon grew out of those discussions. I would like to begin first with some practical items and ask, if you will, to please listen carefully to ensure a smooth flow for our much anticipated lecture with Father Brian Hare. First, restrooms. If this is your first visit to St. Paul's, the exit leading to the restrooms is located to my right, your left. Go through the door, take a right through the double doors and walk over the bridge continue forward, and then take a left turn at the first door. Restrooms are at the end of that quarter on the right, or our greeters will help with directions if needed. There will be a brief Q&A session following Father Hare's lecture. The index cards and pencils the greeters distributed as you enter the church are for writing questions you may have for Father Hare sparked from his lecture. Please follow these instructions. Jot down your brief questions and pass the cards toward the center aisles of your pew. The greeters will collect the cards starting at the front pews at precisely 345. Jerome Marion, We'll quickly scan the questions and select a couple to ask Father Hare, starting at 3.55. Our time is tightly calibrated because we must finish the Q&A portion and leave the sanctuary no later than 4.25, when preparations for the 5 o'clock student mass begins. 
In addition, please return any blank cards and all pencils to the containers with the greeters. We need to leave the pews tidied again for the next Mass. Thank you for your cooperation. Unfortunately, we will not be able to take questions from our virtual audience. This afternoon's event is being recorded and will be posted on the St. Paul's Harvard Square YouTube channel. Please share with others who were not able to join so they can access the event beginning in a couple of days through the St. Paul's Harvard Square website or YouTube. While there, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Last, immediately following the lecture, we will host a reception in DG Bunny Hall. I will give you directions, but I think you have enough from the restrooms. Just follow the crowd. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening to these practical details. Our speaker this afternoon is very familiar with the busy details of St. Paul's parish life. Father Brian Hare is a former St. Paul pastor and senior chaplain of the Harvard Catholic Center. He grew up in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. He earned his, B, his AB and Master of Divinity degrees from St. John's Seminary and his Doctor of Theology from Harvard Divinity School. Father Hare is an internationally renowned theologian who served many years in a major staff position with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C., and has taught at the National War College in D.C. He has served as president of Catholic Charities USA and as president of Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of Boston. He has taught at Georgetown University and Harvard Divinity School, where he served on the faculty as professor of the practice and religion and society, and as interim dean and dean of Harvard Divinity School. Father Hare was named a MacArthur Fellow in 1984 and received the Lotari Medal from the University of Notre Dame in 2004. Father Hare is Secretary for Health and Social Services in the Archdiocese of Boston and continues to teach as the Emeritus Professor of the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of the Practice of Religion and Public Life at the Kennedy School of, Gar of Government at Harvard University. Today's lecture is the first of a two-part series. The lecture today is the Catholic Social Tradition, Sources, Structure, and Specific Issues. Please join us on October 31st for the second lecture, Racial Justice, the Challenge for the Church and the Nation, delivered also by Father Hare. Father Hare has led an illustrious career and continues to lead in a way that inspires, enriches, and informs. Despite his numerous accomplishments, I believe what holds him so dear to people is that he is accessible, a great listener, confessor, educator, theologian, and friend. He certainly demonstrates his faith by his works. Please give a warm welcome to my former professor at Harvard Divinity School, Father J. Brian Hare. told if the microphone is just to my left, it'll work. So if it's not working, raise your hand. So I am always delighted to come back to St. Paul's. Uh, I hold wonderful memories of my time here when I was a graduate student and when I served as pastor. And it's a delight to be inter inter introduced by Angela Jones, who was a parishioner here, and I see her at St. John's in Wellesley also, where I help out in that parish now. And I want to thank Jerome 
Marion uh, for inviting me to give these two lectures. I was asked to give two with a focus on the question of racial justice, and I thought the best way to do that was to present today a kind of overall framework of Catholic social tradition and Catholic social vision, and then deal with the question of racial justice as it confronts both the church and the country in, the, in our time. So let me proceed with today. Uh, I, the title is Catholic Social Vision. Oftentimes, whenever we talk about social justice in the Catholic Church, uh, we use the phrase Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching relates to a body of doctrine, papal in audience, that began uh, at the end of the 19th century uh, with Leo XIII, the Pope of the time, and continues up through the teaching of Pope Francis. But in fact, of course, the Catholic social vision, the idea that part of our faith, an integral part of our faith, is how we defend human dignity, protect human rights, and contribute questions of justice and peace within our own society and as members through that society of the global community. That question is much older than the last 120 years. So I speak about the Catholic social vision of which Catholic social teaching is a piece and a part. So I'll proceed through the lecture in the following way. I want to talk about the sources of Catholic social vision, where it comes from. I want to talk secondly about the structure of how that vision is shaped to engage contemporary society. And then thirdly, I'll use specific issues illustrative of how the tradition speaks today. Basically, there are three main sources to Catholic social vision. There's a biblical source, a papal source, and the source of the Second Vatican Council. The biblical source needs some commentary. In fact, most of Catholic social teaching over the last century has not been principally expressed in the language of the scriptures. As I'll indicate, it has principally been a philosophical based on reason and its ability to communicate beyond the church as well as within the church a vision of social justice. But it's a commonplace uh, statement that one of the major fruits of the Second Vatican Council was that it repositioned the Bible in terms of all of Catholic theology moral theology, systematic theology, and, and beyond. And this repositioning and re-emphasis on the scriptures as part of the Catholic heritage, indeed the root of it, um, touched also the social teaching. So since the Second Vatican Council, there has been much more reliance on the language and the logic and the teaching of the scriptures as one dimension of Catholic social vision. Let me give you an example, or, or three examples really, of how the biblical material feeds into a larger framework of reflection that we call the Catholic social vision. I want to take a text from the book of Genesis. We heard that at Mass today. A text from the prophets. And, and then the language of the New Testament. These are exemplary models, almost snapshots, of how the biblical vision feeds into the Catholic social vision. So the text from Genesis are the, is the opening chapters of Genesis, the so-called creation account. Now, whenever you go to this text, of course, you have to say a word about how it should be understood. My summary of how it should be understood is simply this. One should never try to read Genesis literally, but one should take it seriously. There's truth here to be garnered, but not by trying to treat it literally, which would turn our 
vision of the universe upside down. So what, what happens in these opening chapters of Genesis, the creation account? The thing to understand, of course, is what the author had in mind. And it's, again, necessary in interpreting uh, the book of Genesis to just say, frankly, the author of this text was not a scientist and he's not a modern historian. That is to say, the author of this text had no interest in solving the Big Bang problem, and the author of this text was not someone who wrote in the style of modern historiography with its attention to detail and factual verification. The author of the book of Genesis, I think, was a poet. A poet, poets don't speak in syllogism, they don't use quantitative data, but poets in every age, including our own, speak to our imagination, and through our imagination, they speak to our mind and heart. And so the book, the author of Genesis, I think, writes in the style of a poet, sweeping images that plant ideas in our minds and hearts. And one way to, de to describe how he describes the author of the universe is, is that as you read these chap this opening chapter of Genesis, it's like a great composer shaping a symphony. So God speaks and things happen. There is nothing and then there is light. From darkness to light, there is no life and then there's vegetative life and animal life. And so it goes that God builds the universe in this style of, if you will, a great symphony. And at the pinnacle of God's work, God says, like unto me, I will make them, like unto me. From that truth, Catholic teaching draws the great cornerstone truth of our social vision, and that is the dignity of every human person, that every person is made in the image of God. Indeed, within the community of faith, we talk about the sacredness of the human person. That's language that I'll indicate in a couple of minutes we don't always use, particularly when we're trying to speak to a wider audience outside the church, because sacredness is a heavier, richer term, and without some consensus of faith, it may not register. But dignity does register. And so the first truth of Catholic social vision is that we are bound to protect the dignity of each person, and we are bound to go in response in different ways appropriate to our vocation, go in response to people in need, providing different ways of meeting people's needs. Nobody can do everything, but everyone is called to be sensitive to the needs of others. The first source, biblically, the dignity of the person. The second source, biblically, is much later in the history of Israel, and that is the time of the great prophets, roughly eight centuries before the coming of Jesus. The prophets were the moral conscience of Israel. The prophets were the ones who called Israel back to fidelity when they had strayed for whatever reason. The prophets had a fundamental message. They spoke it differently, but it converged on the same proposition. The prophets said, the quality of your faith depends upon the character of justice in the land. Where you stand with God greatly determines how we stand with each other. And so the prophets then were willing to go beyond that basic proposition and say, we will teach you how to test the character of justice in your society in every age. You should ask, how do the widows, the orphans, and the resident aliens fare among you? 
If you ask somebody from the Congressional Budget Office today who the three most vulnerable groups are in the United States, it's women, children, and resident aliens. The voice of the prophets is as contemporary as this morning's New York Times. The dignity of the person, faith and justice, and then, of course, the culmination of biblical truth in the person of Jesus and ministry of Jesus. And here we would have to go through the four gospel texts to demonstrate in multiple ways how Jesus, in a sense, thinks of himself as a continuation of the prophets, how in the grand, what's called sermon, uh, in the fifth great sermon of Matthew's gospel, the sort of judgment of the universe, he distinguishes who will get into the kingdom of God, and the test cases in so many instances are how we fed the hungry, clothed the naked, etc. So, biblical foundation, part of the Catholic social vision, Genesis, the prophets, and the New Testament are exemplary of a much larger thematic richness that is available to us. Pope Francis is the pope who, he, who uses the scriptures in his social teaching more extensively than any of his modern predecessors. Although, as I will indicate, several of his predecessors since Vatican II have used it. But let me go to the second source of Catholic social vision. It is papal teaching. This is the body of doctrine that I described earlier, rooted from the late 19th century and coming till today. In this area of life, the papacy has been a catalyst for the whole church. In some other areas of life, it was scholars and activists and others who, in a sense, pushed the papacy to, to deal with different issues. But on this question in the 20th century, the papal teaching uh, ha was catalytic for the whole church. And what's interesting is that most of that teaching, it's certainly up through till Vatican II, was expressed in a philosophical mode. And the philosophical mode was the school of natural law. The argument that as human beings, we share certain essential characteristics, principally the capacity for understanding and self-consciousness and the capacity for free choice. And that those two characteristics, in a sense, are where our dignity is rooted in philosophical terms. The papal teaching essentially moved into a philosophical mode for two reasons. On the one hand, pluralism. On the other hand, complexity. That is to say, the papal, the te papal social teaching was primarily directed to the community of the church but it was also meant to make a difference in the wider civil, civic community and indeed the international community. And so one of the reasons for moving to a philosophical mode of argument was to find a way in which those who did not share our faith would find our moral teachings appealing and useful. The first use of the philosophy was in terms of pluralism. The second use of philosophical discourse was as the papal teaching and the social teaching generally was meant to enter the fields of politics, economics, law, and international relations. The broad sweeping imagery of the scriptures can move one's mind and heart but they might not be able to penetrate in specific terms what our obligations are. It is one thing to speak the language of the prophets about justice and social justice. It's another thing if you're trying to design the fairness of the US tax system. You have to enter into another mode of discourse with a different set of analytical tools. So both pluralism and complexity
in a sense, invited the church to use a philosophical mode of discourse. The most clear expression of that tradition, the most clear expression of it in the 20th century was the encyclical letter, Peace on Earth, of John the 23rd in 1963. He took a tradition that had been developing for centuries and crystallized it in one single uh, encyclical letter. So Vatican II becomes a turning point in the sources of Catholic social vision. On the one hand, the language of the scriptures. On the other hand, the language of philosophical argument come together. And as we watch the social teaching from that time on, one of the things to watch in each of the letters or teaching is what's the balance? Because the balance depends in part on the issue that is being addressed. It depends in part on the background and orientation of the Pope who speaks, and it depends on how the teaching then is used in the wider church. So let me say a word about then the third source of the social vision, biblical, philosophical, and then the council itself. The Second Vatican Council obviously was the major event uh, in the history of the Catholic Church in the 20th century. And it was, as I've indicated, a turning point in terms of how our social teaching was expressed. But it also did more than that. Up until the time of the Second Vatican Council, the t social teaching of the church existed and developed. It was taught in colleges and universities under Catholic auspices, and hopefully it was preached from the altar. But the fact of the matter was that the social teaching was sort of looked at as an, I would call it, an option. In other words, there were certain things that you had to believe in order to be Catholic. But the question of the social teaching tended to be on the edge. In those days, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, there was a group of priests in the church that were called the labor priests. They were the ones who dedicated their lives to the social teaching in the area of social and economic justice. But the labor priests spent a good part of their life justifying their existence because they were different than the other priests. And so this, this idea of the social teaching was real, but it was tended to be at the edge of Catholic life, tended to be kind of like for extra credit for some people. What happens with Gaudium et Spes, the document of Vatican II that, uh, that was the heart of, of the social vision at the council, is that the social teaching moves into the center of Catholic teaching. The document itself was quite different than the philosophical argument. The document Gaudium et Spes is biblical in its roots, ecclesiological in its meaning, and filled with theological arguments that invoke faith and reason together. So what happens coming out of the council is you now have an ecclesiological foundation to the social teaching in both its biblical and philosophical mode. These are the three sources uh, of the uh, abiding uh, Catholic vision, if you will. You can talk about, if one wishes to do so, you can talk about uh, the first biblical model as the heir of the council, the philosophical model, the heir of the papal teaching. And together, they make up the inheritance of the social teaching today. So. With those three background issues as our sources, let's turn to the structure of Catholic social teaching, how we blend uh, faith and reason, scripture and philosophy. And here I have to be synthetic in trying to summarize a long tradition. But there is 
there is a way of summarizing the core of the Catholic social teaching from which it then develops in multiple directions. The core synthetic vision, I think, is a three-step process. The beginning of the Catholic social vision is protecting the dignity of the human person. Now here, it's interesting the way in which the biblical theological reinforces the philosophical. Typically, our discussion of the dignity of the person is, as I mentioned, that the dignity of the person is rooted in our capacity for rational reflection and freedom and self-determination of choice. That gives the human person a special standing in creation. But there is a deeper argument that is found in Gaudium et Spes of Vatican II. This long document, the final document of the Council, the one that provides the ecclesiological foundation of which I refer, this document has two main parts. They have four introductory, it has four introductory chapters and then a whole series of chapters on economics, politics, culture, international relations. But the four opening chapters, interestingly enough, are about first, a chapter on the dignity of the person. Secondly, a chapter on society, how we think society comes together. Thirdly, a chapter on human work. And fourthly, a chapter on the church's role in the world. When you look at the chap each of these chapters, each of them close with a kind of resounding Christological affirmation. So my point here is that when Vatican II discusses the dignity of the person, it invokes all the arguments that have been in the social teaching. But then at the end of that first chapter, it says the full dignity of the human person and what we are called to be is found in the Lord Jesus himself, who has entered into our human situation, who lived our human life and demonstrated how the dignity of the person is to be expressed. So there, the deeper theological theme, in a sense, uh, complements the philosophical theme. And when we get to the moral obligation to pay attention to the dignity of each person. In Catholic Christian terms, we can say the person is doubly consecrated, Consecra consecrated by common creation. In my image and likeness, I will make them, but now doubly consecrated in the Lord Jesus who entered our human situation and made himself the brother of all who share human dignity. So the core of the social vision begins with all of that on human dignity. It then moves in a second step to the rights and duties in the moral order that should bind people together. Rights and duties, moral terms, in a sense, enter the social teaching uh, there is some of it in the Middle Ages, but it enters really with the teaching of the popes in the 20th century. Now, how do we understand rights and duties? Rights are moral claims to goods that are essential for human dignity. If I have a right to something, in a sense, I should have the capability of demonstrating that deprived of this good that I have a right to, the good may be uh, adequate wages, the good may be health care, the good may be social support of other kinds. If I, have a, if I have a right to this good, I need to be able to demonstrate that it is essential for human dignity. So rights are different than needs. I may feel I have a need for a Mercedes Benz, but I don't have a right to a Mercedes Benz. But certain goods, some of them political and civil, some of them social and economic, those two kinds of rights are 
the moral claims that protect human dignity. In American liberal discourse, rights are commonly cited and commonly used. What sets Catholic teaching off a bit from at least some authors in the American tradition is that we see duties as equal to rights. So there, that has two different meanings. On the one hand, if you have a right, I have a duty. Your moral claim lays a duty upon me. And as a citizen, I may be able, or we as citizens as a whole, may be able to lay claim on the government that we have needs that are rights and that the government has some responsibility to either protect them or fulfill them. So rights and duties are correlative. And indeed, the way in Catholic thought we develop the notion of rights is to say people have multiple duties and then they have the right to those things necessary to fulfill the duty. So if parents have a duty to provide for their children and their families, then they also have a right to an adequate living wage, as it was called in the tradition, that makes it possible to fulfill their duty. Now, I said that John the 23rd's letter, Peace on Earth, was the best articulation of the philosophical statement. And in what he does, is to build again, almost again in the style of a composer, to build a series of chapters in the encyclical all based on rights and duties. So he starts with the rights and duties of individual relationships. He moves next to rights and duties between the citizen and the government. He moves next to then the rights and duties among states in the international order, and he closes with a chapter that says, here you have the individual, there are rights and duties in individual, social, and international relations. The dignity of the person yields rights and duties. Rights and duties become the fabric that tie people together in political situations. The third step, in the Catholic social vision, in its synthetic form, is the notion that we are social beings. Thomas Aquinas argued that we are social by nature, not by choice. So this, again, is a different conception than, say, a Hobbesian or Lockean conception of how society comes about. In those situations, the intellectual construct that's used is that the individual doesn't belong in society, but chooses to enter it, either to protect his life under Hobbes or in pursuit of freedom and happiness under a law, under a law. Well, our conception is that we are social by nature. We cannot develop as fully human persons without a series of communities to which we belong and which provide for us the framework in which we grow and develop as human beings. Basically, we talk about three communities. The family, which in Catholic teaching is always a cornerstone of society. The family, basically what today we would call the nation state, our country. And then thirdly, the human community. So we belong to these three communities. Now, we can articulate, then, a body of rights and duties at each of those levels. But at this point, that will be too detailed to do, but that's what you'll find, for example, in Pachamenteris. So that's the synthetic view, the dignity of the person, rights and duties of persons, social groups and nations, and the social system. Now, when we talk about the third group, the social system, that would take us into discussions in domestic politics that are paralyzing the U.S. Congress at this time. So what is the duty of the, of the government to deal with a society with the degree of inequality that we have? 
what kinds of responsibilities can be made not simply as political choices but as morally obligatory choices for the state and you would then have to conduct a discussion about the international system because the human community is the third community to which we belong. So there is a way in which we as individuals belonging to a country, our country and to some degree we have re re responsibilities uh, in the international arena. Uh, this past two weeks, for just as an example, Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of Boston uh, has committed to receive a hundred Afghan families into the Commonwealth. Uh, and that simply is an expression of a responsibility, equally responsible to the Haitian community. And so then we have to make a case in the country as a whole with others that these are things that are what we mean by duties in social relationships. So, so far we've got sources and then we've got a structure. And then the question is, how does this tradition grow and develop? The famous American Jesuit, Father John Courtney Murray, who was the principal author of the Declaration on Religious Freedom at Vatican II, Murray said, a Catholic theologian always stands in two places. He stands at the center of his tradition so that he may teach it, and he stands at what Murray called the growing edge of a tradition, that namely this tradition, rooted as it is in memory, rooted as it is in the facts that the scriptures reveal to us, uniquely the, the, the fact of the Lord Jesus, that this tradition always is a tradition of growth. So how does a tradition, conservative as ours is, bound by memory and tradition, how does a tradition grow? Murray argues that tradition grows in two ways. One, when it is confronted by questions it has not yet dealt with or has not dealt with adequately, and two, it also it grows because personalities, whether they be popes or parishioners, see those questions as obligatory for the church and raise them for the development and consideration inside the church. So how has the social tradition grown? Once again, the vision is as old as the scriptures the social teaching as recent as 120 years ago. So there are two ways in which the tradition has grown. It has been driven by issues to grow and develop in order to deal with the issues. And secondly, it has been driven by personalities who help the tradition to become more adequately available to the problems of our time. Look back over 120 plus years and what are the kinds of issues and themes that force the tradition to develop and grow. The first, the Industrial Revolution. So from the middle of the 19th century on in Europe and here, of course, there was this extraordinary development in, in, in economic and organizational terms that we understood to be the Industrial Revolution. No question that it produced many goods and many uh, uh, advances for society, but it also produced huge moral problems. People that had no rights to organize in unions, no government allocation of a just wage, no ways in which workers were protected, or the question of distributive justice was adequately dealt with. And so from the first two contributions uh, to the social teaching of the last century, the first two contributions uh, were Leo XIII and Pius XI, and they, uh, they, those two uh, 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 papal documents, 
were about the Industrial Revolution. They were about how you deal with the moral questions uh, of wages, workers' rights, the right to unionize, and the role of the government uh, in the social and economic uh, makeup of the country. Uh, think of the fact that uh, a famous Harvard professor, Professor Sam Beer, who taught government here for many, many years, taught John F. Kennedy his, his introduction to American government. Sam Beer once said that the U.S. government never accepted social and economic responsibility for people until the New Deal. Well, the church at least was ahead of that. So from roughly 1890 up until 1939, the teaching was about the Industrial Revolution. It tended to focus on the internal life of countries. It tended to be about social and economic rights rather than political rights. Uh, and it was a moral document, as I say, philosophically expressed. The next phase of issues comes at the end of World War II and all the changes that were introduced into the international system. So the, the second phase begins really with Pius XII, who was elected to the papacy in March of 1939. Pius XII was elected because he was a diplomat and the cardinals electing the pope at that time knew that war was on the way. Pius XII was involved in many ways in World War II, some of it highly debated to this day. But on the question of the social teaching, Pius XII was a turning point in the tradition. Because after World War II, the famous French analyst Raymond Aron argued it was the first time in history that there was a truly global international system coming into being. And that global international system was, in a sense, totally disorganized. Pius XII, as a lawyer and a canonist and a diplomat, focused his, his attention uh, on the question of, uh, of how the international community might be organized. And so in that sense, he was in the vein of the founding vision of the United Nations, of which the Vatican has been a part from the beginning. So post-World War II, you get a whole series of new issues. Decolonization in the global south, uh, the emergence of the Cold War, the nuclear age, each one of these found treatment in the tradition, new questions put to an old tradition. Take the tradition on the morality of war. It has been with us in the Catholic Church since at least Augustine. But Augustine never faced, nor did his successors, face the question that the nuclear age posed, where human beings had a capacity to threaten the entire universe. Second stage of issues, internationalization third stage of issues that push development of the social teaching is what the, again, Harvard social scientist Daniel Bell called the development of post-industrial society. These were societies that had first gone through the Industrial Revolution and by the 1960s had gone through other revolutions equal to that. And so there was a whole set of questions here that didn't affect the whole world, but it did affect what we today would call the OECD countries. Highly complicated societies marked by complex political and economic systems with strong technological drive posed their own moral questions. So what we find is from Pius XII until today, every pope has had to confront uh, both a changing international order and at least in post-industrial society, questions that hadn't been faced before. The next stage in the teaching is then the growing interdependence and globalization 
of the international system, a phase that you can mark from the, roughly from the 1970s on into our time. And that was a different world than what faced Pius XII or the immediate uh, teaching after the end of World War II. So at each of these stages, uh, there are new questions put to the tradition and new answers given to them. Finally, there is the contribution of individuals, how people contributed to the growth of the social vision. So let me use three examples, three quotes model, just to pick out things I've already mentioned, but to put them together to demonstrate that it's a mix of a tradition in place, new questions coming to the tradition, and an act of innovation by, uh, by people, and not just popes, to adapt the tradition to a new era. So the three people I'll look at, again, are John John the 23rd, John Paul the Second, and Francis. Um, different people, to be sure, and facing different questions. For John the 23rd, the great text for, we, he, for which he's responsible, I've already talked about Parchman Terrace, but John the John 23rd deserves credit for the two great documents of Vatican II: the document on religious freedom and the document on the role of the church in the world, Gaudium et Spes. Those three texts are foundational for us today. John the 23rd himself, as a matter of style, symbolized that the Catholic Church was willing to come to grips with the modern world, a fact that his 19th century predecessors, except for Leo the 13th, were not willing to say. But he brought about a sense that the church was ready to both learn from the world and hopefully to be able to offer something to the world. And so he developed a set of arguments, again, based on natural law, that were focused on two major questions. How can human rights be protected in a world of independent, sovereign states with no higher authority? That was the question Pius XII faced but he faced it, and then John the 23rd addressed the nuclear age more fulsomely than any of his predecessors. So that was the first development. The second is then John Paul II. So John Paul II, of course, confronts a world first of the Cold War, as his immediate predecessors had. It is a consensus judgment, I think, by political analysts that he is one of the people, not the only one, but one of the people responsible for the collapse of the Cold War because of the role he played in Poland. And so his style and substance cut across two different eras, the end of the Cold War and the post-Cold War world that emerges uh, out of the period of 1990s. John Paul II was basically, I think, in his style, like a global statesman. Uh, he had a way of arriving on the scene and dominating it because of the strength of his personality and to some degree, the strength of his intellect. Um, the judgment on John Paul II often is that he was a very conservative uh, pope in terms of the internal life of the church. But he wasn't a conservative pope in terms of the social teaching. Um, his great text, there were many, but his great text in my mind were his two addresses to the United Nations. One, one year after he was elected and another in the 1990s. Both of them were based on the question of human rights. Indeed, he made a move that could be debated in terms of whether you could carry it off, and that is that he thought of analyzing and organizing international relations through the lens of human rights. So the question that can be debated is, is the lens of human rights adequate to think about the organization of the entire modern international system. 
but he certainly struggled to make the case. And then he gave a second address on the rights of nations. I think John Paul II is an interesting voice to remember in an age of rampant nationalism, rampant ethnic rat nationalism. John Paul II believed in nationalism. He believed in national tradition, but he would reject this ethnic, uh, uh, radical ethnic nationalism that is built on chauvinism today. But in a sense, uh, he expressed himself not only in the UN addresses, but then in his document, Centesimus Annus, on the 100th anniversary of the so first social encyclical. In that document, he both explained the, his view of how the Cold War collapsed, and then he addressed the international system in socioeconomic, political, and political terms. The third uh, uh, person to develop the tradition, of course, is Francis himself. His great text, I think, is the document on the environment, Laudato Si. At least in my judgment, there may be something ahead from him that would trumpet, but in my judgment, that will be the document that epitomizes uh, his overarching vision of social justice. But it's not the only one. During the pandemic, he wrote a fascinating reflection called on fraternity and friendship. And what John Paul, what Francis does is, if John Paul II was a global statesman, I think Francis is a global pastor. Uh, Francis recommends regularly to priests, for example, that pastoral style means accompanying people as they struggle with the questions of life. And to some degree, he has tried to be a global pastor, accompanying the human community uh, in a time of great complexity, danger, and multiple injustices. John Paul II, uh, excuse me, Francis uh, was influenced, I think, by three things. He's a Jesuit, he's a Latin American bishop, and he's a bishop of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, I think particularly the fact that he was a Latin American bishop, a place where the teaching of Vatican II was then developed to, into a whole school of theology that we call the theology of liberation, that he has had some differences with, but he developed his own version of it, if you will. And what, John, what Francis does is not only to talk about the church accompanying the human community. He says the church should be like a field hospital in a battlefield, the way he sees the world as it is today. And his argument is that if you're, the, if you're a church that's like a field hospital, you have to keep your eye on the edge of the circle of life, what he calls existential periphery. So for example, on globalization, John Paul II saw globalization as a human creation, not an inevitable force of nature, but a human creation that could yield benefits and could do harm. And so for him, the idea was how we develop a set of moral norms to test globalization in terms of its motives, its methods, and its consequences but he basically started from a fairly neutral view of globalization. I think Francis, as a Latin American bishop, is more cautious about globalization. Or to put it another way, he sees more of a critique necessary than a compliment necessary. And what he does in both, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what he does in both Laudato Si and Faith and Fraternity, these two documents that are fairly recent, is he develops his idea of where the critique ought to be placed in terms of how the international system is moving, primarily in social and economic terms. But he also, more recently, in his trip to Central Europe, has taken a quite 
strong stance against authoritarian regimes uh, in terms of and excessive nationalism, if you will. Francis has chosen the following issues to, to develop. On the one hand, inequality within nations and among nations. Secondly, immigration. He probably can be called the tribune speaking for immigrants in the globe today. Thirdly, the environment, part of his letter, the subject of his letter on Laudato Si, and also his quite strong position on nuclear disarmament. He's taken these major issues and built on his predecessors, but developed them in his own way. This is a quite inadequate summary of a very long tradition with great complexity, but it's an attempt to at least highlight the meaning of this tradition. And in terms of why this tradition is important to the Catholic Church, let me close with at least one scene that has always stayed with me. It happened at the end of World War II when Europe was trying to recover from World War II, when the, uh, the um, <coughs> excuse me, the Holocaust was just becoming known. And the Dominicans in Paris invited Albert Camus, the voice of the French resistance, Nobel Prize winner, to come and address them as Dominican priests on his dealing with the fact of evil in the world from the perspective of how he described himself, which was basically an, as an agnostic. And Camus gave this talk to the Dominicans. He was critical of Pius XII on the Jewish question. But at the end of the lecture, he said, it may not be possible for us to create a world in which no innocent children suffer. But, he can, but we can create a world in which fewer innocent children suffer. And if we look to the Christians and don't find help, where else will we go? This tradition is important because people watch us. Thank you. The first word that crosses everyone's mind is simply, wow. From the oldest, Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, the prophets, from this morning's New York Times, or the paralysis on Capitol Hill, we just heard an extraordinary synthesis as well as analysis. And when Father Hare invoke the image of the authors and the editors in the Old Testament slash Hebrew Bible of composing images in the spirit of a great composer, of the creator of the universe. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, Father Hare himself, although he would never say that, has himself given us composition that not only informs, but uplifts one and all. And for that, we say many, many thanks. I can tell personally how much the talk moved people and resonated with them because of the extraordinary scope of the questions presented. Because time is so short, I have the doleful duty of asking only a couple of those questions. What I have tried to do is pick a few questions that cover the spectrum. So if your question wasn't covered here, you have a couple of options. One is the reception, another is the second talk on the 31st of October. The first question is one that comes from the heart 
probably as everyone here. It reads as follows. Father Hare, can you please talk a bit about the difference between justice and charity? That is, that food, shelter, health care, etc. are a matter of justice and not simply a matter of private charity. Thanks for your talk. So to answer this question, which comes up often, um, you have to make a couple of distinctions. Uh, one way to distinguish it is justice is what we owe people by moral obligation. Charity is what we provide to others when there isn't an obligation as such. So justice is the basic, call it the basic minimum we owe people, and charity goes beyond that. But that distinction, while it, it, serves, it serves a purpose, and it is always, uh, it is one thing to say, we have an obligation to pay our taxes so the government can help people in need. The question of whether we, we donate to Catholic Charities or Oxfam then becomes a question of charity. That's one way to put it. Another way to put it, a richer way to put it, is that charity is the form and the framework of all Catholic moral action. So when we do justice, it is a form of charity broadly defined. When we tell the truth, it is a form of charity defined in another way. So there's a narrow definition of charity, sharing our what's sometimes called excess means with others. There's a broad definition of charity which says all of our morally right action is, is, is uh, motivated by charity. And then there is the obligation and justice. Now, the obligation and justice then has to be worked out step by step. There's an interpersonal level of justice when we enter into a implicit or explicit uh, contract with people uh, in one form, or simply go into a store and it says Hamburg at $10 a pound, we get the pound, we have an obligation. That's interpersonal justice. Secondly, there's distributive justice. That's the obligation between the citizen and the government, what the government's responsibility is to the citizenry and there you have to get into human rights and what they are. Uh, and that's distributive justice. And then social justice, uh, as Catholic teaching says, and as John Rawls says in his book, social justice is about the basic institutions of a society and whether they are adequately developed and funded so the state can fulfill its responsibility to us. If the first question came from the heart, the second question very clearly is one that intensely divides law and <coughs> academia. It's short, it's sharp. How do you tell a legitimate development of a right from an illegitimate one? Well, of course, the adjudication of that happens at different levels. Uh, First of all, you have to define the right in question. Now, as I say, my way of thinking about right is they are a moral claim to a good that is essential for human dignity. So if somebody is claiming that X is a right, ask whether it fits that definition, uh, whether it fits the definition that it's essential for human dignity. As I said, I have no right to a Mercedes Benz because I feel I should have one, but I do have a right to health care because health care is fundamental to the well being of a person. Now, the American public, the American Congress, and five administrations going on six have tried to develop a systematic approach to health care based on the notion that it's a right. It has accepted more today than it was in the past, but it is still where the fight goes back to. Is healthcare a need or a right? A need is something we have to satisfy for ourselves. 
a right is something that we should have a role in satisfying, but others may also have obligations to have a role uh, to satisfy that right. The third question picks right up on Father Hare's central focus on the late great Jesuit John Horton Murray, little known Republican, who gave us in the United States, we hold these truths at the beginning of the John F. Kennedy administration and laid out a lot of his writings from the 50s and now that we could publish them. And that became a foundation for much of what we did as well as with the Second Vatican Council, the Declaration on Religious Liberty. So someone really gave this a lot of thought. Here we go. Given Murray's idea about social teachings growing out of historical conditions, does this imply that the Catholic social teaching, per se, is simply a temporary teaching to meet the needs of the age? Or do you think it extends beyond to future conditions yet unknown? My short answer is yes. <laughs> it does extend to future conditions as yet unknown because that's, that's part of the definition of development, that you see things you have never seen before. Uh, Murray would, would, was often was talking about development of the church's doctrinal teaching, and I'm sure I won't get this right, but he said the meaning of development is this, that this generation will believe and understand, because of development, what its ancestors believed but did not have a clear understanding of. So development, in a sense, brings our understanding of what we have always believed to new clarity and specification. So it is with rights. Uh, to talk about the right to health care uh, is, to my mind, absolutely necessary today and, to my mind, clear that it should be adopted. But to raise it 100 years ago, except, curiously enough, in Bismarck's Germany, to raise it 100 years ago, no one would have accepted the idea that the government had an obligation to the health of the society. So we see more clearly over time when we are confronted by a challenge we haven't met before. The next question picks up an earlier point in Father Hare's address. Do you think a natural law approach has continuing power to give thought and practice in the area of social justice? Well, it's a hard question to answer uh, because it takes one into the whole spectrum of the philosophical framework uh, within which our public debates are shaped. Um, you, one would have to say that outside Catholic circles, Natural law does not have a broad constituency. Uh, that's, if you ask the question to someone, are you a natural law thinker or a natural law? But if you look at some of the issues uh, uh, that people are passionate about, uh, they find in Catholic teaching not the whole answer, but they find help in Catholic teaching. And so while the school of natural law uh, Although it has had a certain revival uh, in, in the last several decades, the school of natural law is not adhered to by many. Uh, in the on, when the church uses natural law to develop a position on war and peace, social justice, human rights, they are, the church's voice is welcomed into the wider discussion that other people starting from other starting points are trying to achieve. So as an in principle theory, it has not got a majority support for sure. As a contributory voice, it can be if we develop our position adequately. Following right up on that answer, so this is almost uncanny, natural law has often been attacked, as many people here know, as being merely a Western tradition or merely modern times, a Roman Catholic tradition. A person from, if I may be so bold, East Asia, where these terms were not current, 
asks the following question. If natural law is one of the global sources of justice, then what is the relationship between your common good, quote unquote, and your social justice? Well, of course, this is a question that's not confined or asked only of the Catholic tradition. This is a question that comes up in basic human rights debates that have gone on sensibly, intensely since the 1970s. Now, if you go back to the UN Declaration on Human Rights, there was a committee of people who developed those ideas. Professor Mary Ann Glendon from the law school has a wonderful book uh, focused on, on Eleanor Roosevelt, but in its broader dimension on the development of human rights. But one of the people on that sort of internal working group on human rights was the French natural law philosopher Jacques Maritain. And Maritain, uh, when he was asked about his experience of trying to develop the UN Declaration on Human Rights, he said, We're, we all believe in human rights as long as you don't ask us why we believe in it. So his point was, you couldn't get agreement on the roots of people's positions, but you could get a convergence uh, as, as time went on, which is what we have today. Our last question, because time is sadly limited, could almost have been written by a lawyer. It is indeed prolix, and I know prolix when I see it, because I'm usually guilty of it. The Catholic social vision seems to address itself primarily to already existing structural, social, and moral injustices. That is, it appears reactionary, protecting human dignity only insofar as certain pre-existing forces might violate it. But does the social vision ask positive, revolutionary questions as well? Does it recognize that some social injustices might always recur? symptoms as they are of a fundamentally unjust social structure? Well, it is always possible to proceed from individual failure to a systemic argument. Uh, it's a huge step to move in that direction. Uh, natural law, I think, uh, it, in a sense, is not unique to that question. It is anybody who's saying, that X is wrong and Y is wrong, and our task is to solve X and Y, and someone else saying X and Y are wrong, so the whole system's wrong. The church has, on the whole, not been a voice to overthrow systems easily. And so I, I for myself, I see lots of problems in American society. I don't think the whole system's wrong. I think there are social systems in historical retrospect that can be seen as wrong as a system as a whole, but I think what we're dealing with is, uh, is workable. I think the international system, and this is where Francis is so strong, has such uh, uh, a negative uh, ranking on distributive justice and the outcome of a globalized world that, that, that his critique is very strong. I don't know his argument is that you should overthrow the whole international system either, because the cost of sometimes doing that is very high, and the specifics that lead you to do it might not be satisfied by overthrowing the whole. But that's a fairly conservative view, and Catholicism's a fairly conservative institution. Two closing points. In just a moment, when we finish, People may either head directly outside, turn to your right, go down the steps, and there will be a reception in Di Giovanni Hall. Or you may go this way, over the flybridge, and downstairs, take the elevator, particularly if that's easier for you, and come down to Di Giovanni Hall. Now that may sound complex, but there's an easier answer, and that is follow the crowd. For once, that's a good idea. That's actually the moral solution. Having said that, someone who clearly has not followed the crowd, but who has carved out a role for many, many decades 
for so long, in fact, he was one of the first recipients, as Angela so wisely said, of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, has just given us a succinct and very direct set of answers to a very broad set of questions, questions that followed from the spirit of his very own address. And so I think, once again, we may say, thank you, Father. I'll walk you over. 